Good evening and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Bible Study in the Book of Revelation. Tonight is study number one of Revelation chapter 8, and we're going to be reading the first verse. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Now, we're progressing, we're continuing to go verse by verse in the book of Revelation, and we saw way back in Revelation chapter 5, that God began to speak of a book that was written within and on the back side that was sealed with seven seals. And let me read this verse in Revelation 5 verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals. And we spent some time discussing how this book is the Bible, and that God sealed up his word until the time of the end, as he had uh, told Daniel the prophet. And in the book of Revelation, we find that seven seals are upon this book, the Bible, and that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, begins to remove the seals or open up the seals. And Revelation chapter 6 went into detail as many of the seals, six of the seals were open. And and then in Revelation 7, God sort of took, um, I wouldn't say a detour because he was just uh, explaining and expounding on his salvation program throughout the New Testament era, the, the salvation of the first fruits and those saved at the time of the end that would identify with the Feast of Ingathering, the 144,000 that typify all those saved during the church age and the great multitude that typify all those saved during the little season of the latter rain. And now coming out of that chapter and into chapter 8, we are right back into a discussion of the seven seals. This is the seventh seal, the final seal. The other six have been open, and we've discussed them. Now, at this point, since the seventh seal is coming off of the book, the Bible, this would mean that the Bible is now an open book. It is no longer sealed up. And uh, let, let me just explain that if you have seven seals and you remove the first seal, well, the Bible is still sealed. And same with the second and the third and the fourth. As long as there are still any seals upon the book, it is still sealed up. You cannot open it until all seven seals have been opened and removed. Now, that's the case as we read of the seventh seal. Finally, all seven seals are open, and, and now the entire book is open. And this helps us to pinpoint the timing of the language that we find here in this verse that God is giving us concerning what happens once the seventh seal is removed. That is the, the language of the silence in heaven about the space of half an hour takes place at the opening of the seventh seal and therefore at the opening of the Bible as a whole. Now, now all the seals are off and the Bible is unsealed. And this would therefore identify with the time of the end that uh, God said to Daniel in Daniel chapter 12, seal up the word until the time of the end. And then he said that knowledge would increase. The implication being that at the time of the end, God would open up the word of God to reveal information that was not previously known to his people. And that's why he also goes on to state in Daniel 12 verse 10, the wise will understand, but none of the wicked will understand. And if you understand something, you've learned it, you've gained knowledge, your knowledge has increased. But that's not the case 
for the unsaved people of the earth. Well, now going back to Revelation 8 verse 1, and I'll read this again. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Well, let's just take this one statement at a time, one phrase at a time. There was silence in heaven. And what does that mean, that that there was silence in heaven? And um, again, it would, of course, infer that there was not silence in heaven before this seventh seal had opened. There, there must have been some sort of noise, some sort of activity going on in heaven. But now that the seventh seal is open and it's the time of the end, we know that those two go together. Now that the Bible is an unsealed book and finally what God had spoken to Daniel about regarding the end of the world, the appointed time of the end season was now taking place and therefore silence occurred in heaven for this period said to be about the space of half an hour. Well, let's first look at some verses that that show activity in heaven where there is not silence in heaven and we read of this in Luke 15 in uh, some of the parables that the Lord Jesus gives us as he says in Luke 15 in verse 3 and he spake this parable unto them saying what man of you having a hundred sheep if he lose one of them doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it. And when he has found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you, that likewise joy shall be in heaven, over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Well, here we have an example of God speaking of a sinner that repenteth, and and that is describing someone that becomes saved. They're granted the gift of repentance, which is all part of the gift of God's salvation, and and there is reaction. There, there is a response in heaven. Heaven is not um, idle. It, it, it's not disinterested. Heaven, which we could mean to be God's kingdom, God himself, and, and those that serve him in that glorious kingdom. Heaven is very much concerned about the affairs of the gospel on the earth. It is very interested in God's salvation program. And when even one sinner experiences the grace of God and and God has created a new heart within and, and given that person repentance to turn from their sins, then it says there is joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. This is repeated, basically, in uh, the next parable, in verse 8 of Luke 15. Either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, does not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it? And when she has found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Joy in the presence of the messengers of God. And and that could be true believers who are in heaven in their soul existence, as well as angelic beings that are also angels or messengers of God. And it could be God himself, as the Lord Jesus is called the messenger of the covenant. There is joy in the presence of the angels, again, 
it, it's repeated over one sinner that repenteth. And, and um, once again, this is describing the wonderful reaction of heaven regarding someone who becomes saved. Now, uh, there's a third example in this uh, chapter that, that the Lord Jesus gave, another parable concerning a father who had two sons, and the one son was lost, just as one of the sheep was lost and one of the woman's coins was lost. Well, the one son was lost. He, he wasted his substance with riotous living. But then he came to himself and he returned to his father, and that's a beautiful picture of how God works in the minds and souls of those that he's dealing with as he draws them to himself as this son came home. And then there was rejoicing. In, in Luke 15, it says in verse 21, And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and is found, and they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field, and well, it, it continues on to describe an, another point that this parable is making. But here we see they were making merry, and it does say in verse 25, uh, when the elder son came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. It was not silence, but there was activity. And of course, this is an earthly story to teach us a heavenly meaning. It is something to teach us concerning joy in heaven. It is a noisy thing. It is something where uh, it is uh, noticeable as God rejoices and, and the kingdom of God, the angels that are in the presence of God rejoice over a sinner that is granted the salvation of God. And, and this was all, of course, going on constantly throughout the day of salvation. However, there was a break as God really has laid out his gospel program through times and seasons. And Lord willing, in our next study, we'll, we'll take a little time and we'll just discuss how the times and seasons of the different reigns that the Lord speaks about in the book of Joel took place. And there, there was time of rain followed by a period of relative inactivity in the Old Testament. And then Again, a time of rain uh, uh, during the church age, followed by a period of inactivity or a time of silence in heaven. And, and silence in heaven would mean that the joy, the rejoicing, the making merry, the tremendous um, response of God and, and the inhabitants of his kingdom of heaven has ceased because there is no one being saved on the earth. Well, we, we would say no one, although the word translated as silence in uh, Revelation 8 verse 1, if we're to follow how the Bible uses that word, we, we do have to uh, condition the, our understanding of that word a little bit because this is the same word that's found in Acts 21 in verse 40 uh, where the Apostle Paul is in view and let me read this in Acts 21 40 it says and when he had given him license that's a, a Roman ruler who's allowing Paul to speak to the Jews they had wanted to kill him because they thought he was bringing Gentiles into the temple but now Paul is permitted to speak. And then it goes on to say, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with the hand unto the people. And when there was made a great silence, 
he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying. Now Paul is speaking to them in, uh, in Hebrew, and they are listening. There's a great silence. This is the word we find in Revelation 8, verse 1. But in, in the next chapter of Acts, in Acts 22, we get a few more details in the first couple of verses. Men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence, and he saith. And then the Apostle Paul goes on to make his defense. But since it is said, they, after they recognized he was speaking to them in the Hebrew tongue, they then kept the more silence, which would uh, imply that it was a greater level of silence. And, and therefore, there must have been some noise, not much, but some uh, noise when, when we read in the previous chapter and verse of Acts 21.40 that there was made a great silence. And that allows for the slightest bit of activity and, and therefore the slightest bit of salvation. So, when we read in Revelation 8, verse 1, When he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Well, this, this would indicate that there is not joy taking place in heaven as would have been more typical throughout the church age, throughout the period of the early reign when God was saving individuals. He, he, he was saving not a great multitude, but he was saving much more than he did in the Old Testament. But now that rain had ceased, and there was a period of relative inactivity. As a matter of fact, we can state absolutely, with, without hesitation, that no one no one at all was being saved within any church in the world at the very beginning of the Great Tribulation period. And, and this would be the end of the church age, the judgment beginning at the house of God, and the beginning of the Great Tribulation. The beginning of about a half hour of silence. No one at all in any church, in any denomination, uh, whether Catholic or Protestant, whether independent or house church, in any church, we can say without question that none were being saved within the church. That would have been an impossibility because at the very beginning of this point, the Holy Spirit left the congregations. Christ departed out of the midst of of the church, the candlestick within the churches went out, and it, it just cannot be that anyone could have been saved in that darkened spiritual condition. So, if there was anyone being saved, and, and the language um, of silence, that word, as we followed it into the book of Acts, we would have to say uh, it perhaps permits the idea of a relative handful of individuals being saved for this period of about a half hour, and, and uh, we'll look into defining that period of time a little bit more later. But concerning God's salvation program, we would say hardly anyone at all was being saved, and if anyone was, it would have been individuals outside of the churches even then in the world. As uh, perhaps someone could have heard the gospel outside of their church and congregation and, and God maybe saved a handful. Now by a handful, we're talking about two or four or six people. It, the language of the Bible does not allow for very many at all. If at all it could be that none were saved, that's also 
um, very possible according to this this language. What we know is that now something drastically had changed and and God's program of evangelizing the world through the churches was now coming to an end or had come to an end. The church age had ended and the Holy Spirit had departed from the church and the abomination of desolation, another name for Satan, had entered into the holy place. The man of sin took his seat in the temple. All this language is really describing the the same thing, this silence in heaven, this beginning period of time. But why does it say there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour? What is the full hour and why was there silence only for half an hour? No, not half an hour. It wasn't exactly a half, but about half an hour. And that means it could have been less and or perhaps it could have been more than half an hour. We'll see that the idea of less than half an hour fits uh, much better the rest of the language of the Bible. And it's said to be about the space of half an hour because the great tribulation period itself, the entire period of God's judgment on the churches, is called one hour. We, we read this, for instance, in Revelation chapter 17. It says in Revelation 17, in verse 8, The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not, and yet is. And here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth, And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and he is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. Now, you might recognize some of that language. That's why I read a few verses leading up to that point. As verse 12 mentions one hour. And the language of the beast is the title. The the name beast is the title that God assigned to Satan exclusively for his period of rule during the Great Tribulation period, which is typified as one hour. It, it's the last hour. We read of a parable, a parable of workers working in, in, in the vineyard, and they're hired at three-hour intervals, except there comes a special case, a special situation at the 11th hour, and the workday is only 12 hours. So there is a difference that occurs at the end of the day, for the final hour. And that 11th to 12th hour, that one hour, is representative of the entire Great Tribulation period. And we've learned, and we'll we'll discuss this as we go along, that the Great Tribulation actually uh, worked out to be a full 23 years, a full 8,400 days in length, beginning on May 21, 1988, and continuing until May 21, 2011. That 23-year period is the one hour, it's what is referred to as one hour, wherein the beast ruled, wherein Satan had taken his seat as the man of sin reigning in the temple the churches and congregations of the world. And, and that's why God is speaking of about half an hour, because the spiritual condition that has come upon the world 
at the beginning of the Great Tribulation. And again, remember the point in which the seventh seal, all seven seals are removed, is at the time of the end, the beginning of judgment. And that would be the once judgment commenced and began at the house of God. And at that point, there is silence in heaven, wherein virtually no one is being saved anywhere in the earth for about half an hour. And yet, it is not God's complete plan to allow that spiritual condition to continue throughout the entire Great Tribulation period. Or else he would say, there was silence in heaven for one hour. If he had no intention of saving anyone during the Great Tribulation, but he had in reserve a plan actually to save a great multitude of souls. We, we just finished reading about that in the previous chapter. There was a great multitude from every nation and tribe and tongue that came out of Great Tribulation. They were saved during that period of time. And, and that's why God had to bring about a change after about a half hour of that horrible judgment in which virtually no one was being saved. He had a, a plan to send forth the latter rain to bring in that final harvest of souls. And they would identify with the Feast of End Gathering. This would be the great multitude. This is why God says in Matthew 24, in verse 21 and 22, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. You see what God is saying here? He's speaking of the Great Tribulation, and he's saying, unless the character of those days be shortened, that is, if the silence in heaven continued throughout the entire hour, then he could not save that great multitude. Therefore, he must shorten those days and finish his salvation program through the outpouring of the latter rain and the deliverance of that great multitude of souls from all the nations of the world. And this is referring to God's program outside of the churches. He never shortened the judgment upon the churches themselves. What happened at the very beginning of the Great Tribulation, as there was silence in the churches, continued, or as there was spiritual darkness within the congregations, that characteristic continued throughout the entire 23-year period, and none of the great multitude came from within the churches. But as far as outside of the churches in the world, well, God brought about a, a vastly different scenario. He changed the condition from silence to once again, there being great joy in heaven over numerous sinners that were granted repentance as God saved so many from, from around the world.